Welcome back uh, to IG24, a 24-hour inclusive conference. Um, this uh, conference is brought to you in partnership with Barclays Access, Adobe, Intopia, Tetralogical, Infoaxia, Intuit, WebAble, and DQ as well. It's not on the list, but um, they, I believe they are one of the uh, the supporters. You can follow us on Twitter at ID24Conf. And if you have questions with the presenters, tweet them using the ID24 hashtag for our Q&A at the end of the session. You can also add you, there on the YouTube um, page you can uh, of the session, you can ask questions there. A reminder that IG24 is a respectful community and you can find our code of conduct on the inclusive design24.org event site. Uh, over to you, Alistair. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Chad Gowler talking about simulation exercises through the lens of play. Over to you, Chad. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about simulation exercises and play. Um, so as you said, my name is Chad. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Kitation, which is the word citation, but with a K instead of the C. Um, yeah, um, and I'm really pleased to, to be part of this like amazing conference and, and talking to you all today about, about things I'm really, really interested in. So I want to start out uh, talking about this game. So uh, this game is called Hellblade Senua Sacrifice. Uh, it's made by a studio called Ninja Theory. They make uh, what is what we would call perhaps a triple A game in that, you know, there's a lot of money behind it. There's a lot of people who make it. Uh, the graphics are really good, etc. cetera. Um, and this game is about Senua, who is the uh, lady in the screenshots with the blue face paint. Um, it's kind of set in like a Norse mythology type Type, type thing. So uh, the plot of the game is that she is going out to save the soul of her dead lover from Helheim, which is like the Norse equivalent of hell. Um, and as she does this, she has to fight off like monsters. Like she's being chased by this thing called the darkness. Um, yeah, and you kind of, it's, it's just standard, like third person kind of attacking things, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, the thing with this game though that makes it kind of interesting is that Senua, the character, has a form of psychosis um, and that as you play the game you hear voices um, and you see things like the darkness and stuff and these are actually kind of heard illusions um, or kind of things that are caused by her psychosis. And Ninja Theory when they created this game uh, made sure they did a lot of work with experts, um, psychiatrists, but also with people who have lived experience of psychosis uh, to make sure that their depiction of it was as accurate as possible. So yeah, this is a game and it has all the cool game stuff like, you know, graphics and, and combat and all that kind of stuff. It's out on like all the all the various major consoles, PC, etc. Um, but it is also a simulation exercise. It is a way, if you want to, to simulate what it might be like to have uh, a particular form or some particular symptoms of psychosis. So it's a simulation exercise as well as a game. And that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. So we're going to go through a few things today. Uh, I'm going to touch on what simulation exercises are and some of the criticisms of them. Um, then we're going to look at what play is and why I've decided to do like, what is the lens of play and why am I talking about play and why did I open with a video game? And we're going to talk about that and it, uh, how that relates to empathy. Uh, then we're going to do a bit of a, how to apply some of the things that we've learned from gaming and game studies, how do we apply them to a simulation exercise in order to make it more effective when we're training people about accessibility or disability awareness. Um, and then right at the end, I've got a few kind of like links and a few kind of like little digital games and stuff, which I think are kind of really cool in this space that, that would be kind of fun for folks to try out. So a simulation exercise. Um, so on the screen, you know, there's there's these kind of four kind of types of glasses that simulate various visual impairments uh, and you, you can also get things that will simulate things like you get gloves that will simulate arthritis for example um, and we use these in order to and they're, they're quite popular when you're kind of training people in kind of things like awareness uh, so disability awareness kind of introductions to accessibility those kind of things so you often you'll get someone to put on the glass pair of glasses that you know simulate something like glaucoma for example um and then you know you will go go and fill out this web form and then they go and fill out the web form and go oh the web form is terrible if you can't see properly um they also get called empathy exercises but i there's a lot of contention around that phrase and i don't really want to do that because uh, i'm going to talk about empathy a lot and it'll get confusing so i'm going to call them simulation exercises because these things where you basically get people to 
have or, or simulate the experience of having a, a disability in order to kind of do some things. And we do these particularly in digital accessibility, which is my background, um, in order to basically we want designers and I'm going to use designers as like my catch all word for everyone who works in software development. So your developers, use researchers, content, product, et cetera, et cetera. It's just to say designers because that's shorter. Um, basically we want designers to have empathy with disabled people. We want people to understand the barriers that disabled people face when they are using our software products. Um, and so, you know, we and the idea behind this is that when they have that empathy, that will lead towards inclusive design. That if people can experience barriers, then they will know how to design systems that mean those barriers don't exist anymore. So someone will go, oh, OK, I remember when I did this exercise that simulated something like tunnel vision and it was really hard for me to have to keep scanning the screen. So I know that we need to have like a one column layout, for example. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on kind of the criticisms of simulation exercises. I think there's, there's been a lot of talk and I've read a lot of things and stuff about it already, but there's a couple of kind of really interesting points that, that I kind of just want to talk about before we kind of get into the play stuff. Um, because I was kind of really interested in this idea of like, well, okay, what do they actually generate empathy? And does, does generating empathy, if someone has empathy, does that actually improve outcomes for people? So there's a couple of studies that I uh, want, just want to talk about very briefly. The first one is by Naria Redmond at Al. Uh, the paper is called Crip for a Day, the Unintended Negative Consequences of Disability Simulations. So they looked at uh, doing simulations of vision impairment and dyslexia, I think. Um, and they kind of showed through this that actually, you know, people, it did improve empathy or people did gain empathy and you can kind of measure empathy academically through scales, which perhaps isn't the best way to measure empathy, but it's kind of what we've got. Um, but they kind of found that actually, uh, in this quote from the paper, it, it promotes distress and fails to improve attitudes toward disabled people. So people would do the simulation exercise and they would become very upset. They would become, they would feel things like hopelessness. Um, they would feel very, um, I can't think of the word, but they would kind of feel very confused. They would kind of feel embarrassed that, that perhaps that, that they would, you know, they're doing this dyslexia simulator and they can't actually do the task and that, that kind of leads to embarrassment. And because it kind of led to all these very negative feelings, it actually meant that they were less likely to want to involve disabled people. So I think this was with researchers, um, you know, they were less likely than to involve disabled people in their research because they kind of started to associate it with those feelings of shame and embarrassment and, and distress that they had had, um, which isn't the thing we want. That's kind of the opposite of the thing we were trying to do. And another really interesting paper to, to have a look at is uh, Cynthia Bennett and uh, Daniela Rosner uh, did a talk, did a paper around the promise of empathy. So this is very much around uh, software design and the paper's got loads of really good points in it. Um, but the one I started to think about a lot was actually, you know, these exercises kind of set up this uh, two party state, if you will, that we kind of, as they say, you know, it renders designers as non disabled and it renders people with disabilities as non designers. We kind of set up this thing where, you know, we need to teach designers how to be disabled because the people with disabilities aren't in the room with us. They're the people out there. They're kind of a big other, um, you know, and actually you can't really empathize with somebody if you're thinking about them as being solely in the out group as opposed to part of the in group. Um, and right at the end of the talk, sorry, I, I do have a link to like all the references and stuff that I'm going to talk about and like all the other things that I read but, but aren't in the talk so you can kind of have a look through, through these yourself because they're interesting reading. And all these things and kind of lots of people have written blogs, lots of people with, with disabilities and various conditions have written blogs about how the issues they have, particularly with simulation exercises and what have you. And all of them come to a singular conclusion, really, which is that we need to be working with disabled people, that rather than having a bunch of sighted people, for example, put on a load of glasses, um, you know, and have something that's sort of an experience for a very short period of time. What we actually need to be doing is including more disabled people. You know, we we should have more disabled people in the tech industry. Like the tech industry should represent the population. And uh, you know, we should have more disabled designers and developers and what have you. Um, you know, we should be working more with our users who have disabilities or access needs, those kinds of things. And I think this is a good aim um i think like the optimist in me thinks this is a really good idea um the realist in me knows that we're not even close to being here yet so you know what do we do in the meantime uh while we do this you know you, you may not have any disabled people on your team um you know you may not have uh if you're building depending on your product life cycle where you are you may not have kind of a user group to draw upon 
So if you don't have any existing users, you might not be able to go out and find existing users with hunter disabilities or access needs. Um, you know, so you might not have anyone around that you can kind of get to assist you. Um, but actually, the main problem is this thing called participant fatigue, and participant fatigue isn't unique to uh, say with people. It's something that a lot of people in minorities face. Um, it's essentially where you basically get fed up of having to say the same things over and over again. So, you know, as an example, um, I'm a non-binary person. Um, my gender is non-binary, and I have been part of at least five PhD studies on non-binariness and language, um, and by the third one, I was very bored of answering the same questions. I was wondering why they weren't all talking to each other. Um, and I haven't seen any of the outputs from any of those PhD studies. So the fatigue is not just, I keep saying something and that's annoying or it's boring or it's time consuming. It's also that, you know, you often don't see the benefit of all that time and stuff you've put in. And even if you do have to say with people in your workplace, like they have actual jobs to do, you know, they're not there just to be like the experts in their own, you know, condition or what have you you know they're they're there to do the job that they're actually doing um, you know and they don't have the time to come and join us with all of our various you know designings and trainings and what have you so yeah so you know we want to be at the point where we have we, we do inv involve more and more disabled people in the accessibility space um but we're not there yet and you know um simulation exercises are still the thing perhaps we need to use while we're kind of getting to that goal so why do I want to think about play? Um, so the small reason is that, um, as you'll probably be able to tell, uh, I'm a massive video game nerd, um, but I also uh, did a master's a couple of years ago where I uh, my dissertation and then a published paper around discomfort in digital games. So I'm really into kind of player research and game research, which is where I kind of uh, really got into this. And you know, I've been looking at things like empathy and serious games and stuff for a while. Um, but the big reason, is all the thing that kind of really sparked off the idea for the talk was kind of being in a training session myself and you were about to start the simulation exercise and you've got all the glasses and all that kind of whatnot all, all set up for people you know and, and as trainers or when I've been trained you know this phrase uh go and have a play comes about a bit like people go like oh here's all these glasses like go and have a play with them try them on do some stuff have a play and I kind of thought well if we're going to say that then we should just go all the way like what if we decide the simulation exercise is play like what will that do to the how if we frame the simulation exercise like that like will that have any impact um on on their on their effectiveness essentially so what is play to start with I mean, play is kind of um it's a very complex topic um probably a bit more complex than a lot of people would, would think it is um first of all um play is we kind of associate it with children um but play adults play um you know we, we are going to talk about games you know, adults play various types of games um but also it's not unique to humans right uh many animals play i've just gotten literally a week ago a pair of kittens uh and they play a lot um you know it's it's something that's kind of that's kind of kind of universal kind of across kind of mammals i, I guess and probably other animals as well and what it does is it allows us to explore the reality that we're in within a safe space. So you know, the reason children play is because it is a way for them to explore and start to understand all this messaging that they're receiving from just being in the world. Um, you know, it it allows you to, and it's it's safe. So you know, you kind of have so kittens, for example, we go out to them like they're playing at hunting behaviors because if they went out to try to try and hunt prey, they probably like not come off very well right like the, the prey would fight back because kittens are very small but when they're just hunting each other or me uh you know like that allows them to learn those behaviors in a way that's not actually going to damage them you know children will climb higher and higher up climbing frames and if they fall off it doesn't matter because there's a nice soft uh, floor underneath them you know and that helps them to kind of learn their limits and explore who they are um you know and it's not just fun or it's not just happy you know play kind of uh, conjures these ideas of kind of being frivolous or being fun um but play can be very dark play can be very serious you know to take the children example like the image i've used here is, is, a, is of a child playing with trucks of some kind but um you know play can be you know, children who have experienced trauma for example will use play to try and explore those traumatic experiences um as adults there's a form of play called nordic freeform it's a type of uh, role playing and um, so you kind of sit in a room and you role play through a scenario um 
but that looks at very difficult topics like uh, post-apocalyptic survival. It looks at things like sexual assault. Um, you know, there's a game called Abuse the Fat Man, where essentially you verbally abuse somebody in your group. Um, but that's a form, it is still a form of play. They are playing with those concepts within these boundaries in this safe space. So it can be very dark, it can be very serious. Um, and it's really engaging. Play really engages people because you have that emotional input. Um, you know, you are often emotionally invested in play. You often have an emotional driver to play, um, but also, and also you're interacting. So play is interactive. It's not passive in the same way that something like reading might be um, or listening or something like that. So it's engaging from kind of those two fronts. Now, the issue with play is that kind of play almost by definition is very free form and there's no goal to play. Otherwise it wouldn't be play anymore, it'd be work. Um, and we don't really want people to do that. And that's what makes you think of a simulation exercise at the minute is you go, just go and play with this. And then, but then you don't really know what people are learning. You don't know what the outcome's gonna be. And this is where games come in because games essentially are a controlled play space. That a game is basically go and play within this space where we have set up as experts, as accessibility experts, we will set up the systems and the rules. And then we want, then you can kind of play in that space and people will break those boundaries. People will push up those boundaries and that's okay. That's part of the learning. But this games are the way I think we can get people from A to B rather than just that very generic go and have a play with that. Um, and when I talk about play, even though my background is in video games and I started off with the example of a video game, um, there are various forms of play. So here we've got a board game with dice, um, you know, video games obviously are part of it, card games, um, war gaming. So this is where you kind of get uh, little tiny like figures of soldiers and then you go out according to rules and you play war. Um, and actually things like the Ministry of Defence employ people who play war games to help them devise and test military strategies. That's a form of play, but it's very serious because it's kind of a, about a real world thing. Um, so, you know, when I talk about gaming, I am talking about these various forms of gaming, even though a lot of my examples will be video games based just because of my background. So gaming can have a positive effect on empathy, which is kind of why I kind of got into this. Um, there's been various studies that have shown that. Um, so, for example, you know, if you get someone to play a game about um, refugees, for example, they are more likely to donate money and they're more likely to take more money to a charity than if they just read a blog post or listen to a podcast, uh, for example. Um, good. Uh, yeah, so there's kind of been a few studies around that. Uh, you know, newspapers, I don't know if it's kind of newspapers, news sites use games a lot to try and explain things that are very complex, they like immigration um, or like homelessness, for example. Uh, and there are kind of two reasons why gaming is really good at, or can have this effect of generating empathy. So first of all, it's interactive, as I said with play, like you are in, you can't really be passive when you're playing, you have to interact with the character that you're playing, with the rules that you're playing, with the system, with the world in which you are playing. And that interactivity means you kind of have to give some of yourself to that world and that is part of the way you generate empathy. But the main thing is this idea of the connected identity or the third identity. Uh, so, as an example then, let's, let's take the game we talked about at the beginning, Hellblade. So Senua, her goal is to go out to find her lover in Helheim. That's what she wants to do. My goal when I'm sitting down to play the game is I want to waste a couple of hours of my time, or maybe I want to learn about psychosis, um, or maybe I just want to play this game because everyone's talking about it. Like my goals are basically just to spend my time. But as we play, and as I play, like, as you control this character, you their successes are your successes, their failures are your failures. You know, you make decisions on their behalf and you kind of create this Chad as Senua identity. You create this kind of third identity in the middle where actually you, you start to share your goals, you start to share your pain, you know, your character gets hit and you flinch, you know, that kind of thing. And that kind of is what empathy is, right? Like you, I'm like, I am literally ex experiencing the world through her um, and not just through myself, you know, and Nordic freeform we talked about earlier has this concept called bleed um, where, you know, where when you're playing games, especially games that are very serious, you know, you your view on the world will influence what the character does but also the character's view on the world will influence what you do like you you get so immersed in a game that you it's very hard to separate you from the character um and this is kind of where empathy comes from right um so you know that creates a very empathetic experience so it's no longer i'm just hearing voices in my headphones it's like i am hearing the voices in her head there are a couple of caveats to this that you know 
even though there is a lot of evidence for this, you know, and there is a lot of work around games empathy, like they're not empathy machines. You know, you can't just sit somebody unguided in front of a video game for half an hour and then they come out and go, wow, I have so much empathy now. Um, something I've learned a lot from my own studies is that some people just don't really respond very well to empathy um, in games. Like people, people play games that are very emotional but don't really get that response. They don't really create that identity perhaps in the same way. Um, and some people don't respond to empathy very well in general, and that's fine. It's not motivated for them, and that's absolutely fine. You know, and empathy isn't the only tool that we use to try and persuade people to build accessible systems, right? Like this is why we also talk about things like technical things, financial incentives, you know, legal incentives, et cetera, et cetera, and always get people to make stuff accessible. So the caveat here is that, you know, this isn't gonna work for everybody, and that's fine. Um, you know, I'm not this is not a silver bullet that I'm kind of sharing with people. So for the next big chunk of the talk, I'm just going to go through. Um, so, you know, we they found out you know, that, you know, games are, are good at creating empathy. Um, but what is it, not just what is it about games that does that, but how can you make games in a way that increases that effect or make that effect more likely to happen? Um, so I'm going to go through a few of those, uh, kind of explain what they are, um, and then explain how you might want to integrate this into simulation exercises that you run yourself. Now, when I originally pitched this talk and originally had the idea for this talk, um, it was before the lockdown. And my kind of idea was that I really wanted to actually put those these things into practice. Um, but for various reasons, that hasn't been possible. So this is still very much at a theory stage. Um, but yeah, these are these are ideas that I think, you know, that, and I've given this talk uh, at Leeds a little while, uh, a little while ago, um, you know, and kind of some people said they're kind of doing some of this stuff and, and things already. So yeah, that's interesting. So this is kind of a bit theoretical at the moment, just because of the just because of the kind of terrible situation that, that we're in at the minute. Great. So the first one is role taking. Um, so role taking is the process of assuming the role of another individual in order to stand their point of view. So I think that the issue we have with simulation exercises and the reason that they are can be harmful, you know, and they is because they create that distress. They create that all of a sudden you've made someone who has spent their whole life navigating the world by sight. All of a sudden you're going, you're removing that sight and then saying, what would you do? And that doesn't simulate visual impairment. That simulates the experience of losing your sight suddenly, which isn't the same thing necessarily. Um, because when I put on a pair of tunnel vision glasses, I am still, it's still me experiencing what it is like to look through, to have tunnel vision, right? But what I'm suggesting instead, and to try and kind of break that up a little bit, it's actually rather than playing yourself, you should be playing a character, right? So you could kind of, and this is someone that you can, um, this is perhaps where you can include disabled people to help you create these characters, you know, by writing their own stories, recording a video about themselves, creating something like personas, uh, you know, the government digital service in the UK has accessibility personas, for example, you might want to use those, you might want to generate your own. Um, you know, in order to create a role that you want the participants to assume. So for example, say you've got Bob, he works in payroll, he has a vision impairment, uses JAWS, uh, you know, and he has to generate, you know, you know, thousands of payroll reports or something in a very short period of time. You want to play, you want someone to play the role of Bob, right? You know, and that helps to kind of, kind of set up enough separation that people don't feel that distress um, and that actually, they will just generate the empathy through interacting with that role. So think about what role you want the participant to assume. Is it based on your person? Is it not? Um, and how do you want to set that up? Um, so again, yeah, involve disabled people here. So you only have to talk to them for like, a, you, know, you can make resources that are repeatable rather than having to get someone into your training all of the time. Um, so think about that and think about having the role be very three-dimensional. And the other issue that the reason that the simulation exercise episode from its distress is that it kind of gives people this idea that having a disability or having health condition is only about distress it's only a negative thing it's only an upsetting thing all of the time you know and that's not true you know disabled people are, are rounded people with many different types of life experience you know and, and we want people to have a better understanding of that so think about getting people to play a role play a character uh, perhaps rather than just like popping some glasses on them you want to have goals um so the games that are really good at creating empathy have goals um and this helps for two reasons first of all it helps to avoid that aimless play because you want people to achieve something so if you say we're starting here and you need to do this thing um you know that actually gives people something to achieve and people like achieving things right we get like this sweet dopamine hit when we achieve something and that helps us feel good um you know and that that helps keep people engaged but the other thing is actually like goals are part of the way that connected identity I've talked about is created. So when you have a goal, you 
basically in order to achieve a goal you have to make a lot of decisions as you work towards that goal you know I want Senua to go over there and fight that thing I have to make lots of decisions about okay like how do I get there like how do I want to fight do I want to sneak up on them um like what is the terrain like how am I going to work that into the fighting what type of fighting style am I using and it's making those decisions as the character that creates and deepens that connected identity so play a role and give that role goals so that people have something to achieve and that they have to make decisions and that decision making will help them generate that empathy Related skills is challenge, and I kind of want to talk about challenge a little bit, um, mostly because uh, I think when people think of challenge, they think of uh, perhaps what we, we, what we would call conventional challenge, you know, it's kind of skills based, so you know, you can have a task where perhaps you say someone put on these arthritis gloves and then do something very dexterous like count money, for example. Um, but there are other forms of challenge, there are emotional challenges, right, like it might be that you go, okay, we want you to simulate your disability and then go and do a task, like go out into the real world, you know, go to the cafeteria, buy a sandwich, for example, that's your task, and that could be very, and that might be very easy in terms of like, well, it's easy enough to kind of walk down the corridor or what have you, um, but it might be very emotionally difficult to be in that situation where perhaps people are looking at you or people don't quite understand you, that kind of thing. Um, so you want to think about what type of challenge will convey the message that you're trying to what message are you trying to convey and kind of what type of challenge do you want to do about? Um, and don't make the task impossible. And I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about this because it, it kind of seems counterintuitive because the reason we're in accessibility is because often if we, if we don't make things accessible, then we do make things impossible for disabled people. And we do want people to understand that. Um, but if you make them do an impossible task, that's only going to generate those that feeling of despair and hopelessness that we saw from the, the previous studies. So make it hard. And then in the debrief, talk about, yeah, OK, that was hard, but in the real world, they don't even have that thing that you eventually use to get around that. Use social connection. Uh, so training is very rarely something you do one on one. Um, in my experience, you know, and actually as humans, we just learn a lot from each other. Um, we observe, we imitate, we communicate. So think about having a collaborative element or a competitive element. Um, so a collaborative one might be that you kind of, you want to lead people around, perhaps you, you teach people sight guiding by one person simulating the blindness, of another person kind of learning how to be a sight guide, for example, or kind of other ways of, of doing that. You want to achieve a goal together. Um, you may want to be competitive. Um, like I said, when I gave this before, someone spoke to me that they said they have an exercise where you have to try and get through a page with a screen reader, like as fast as possible, like the fastest person wins. So you can, you can use points and races and stuff and all that cool gamification stuff as well. So kind of use the fact that you've got multiple people to your advantage. And then related to what I was saying about challenge, um, they you know, studies have kind of found that actually if you just if you're trying to teach someone something very serious through games, so perhaps you have a game about climate change, for example, if you only focus on the barriers or on the very stark negatives, that either people bounce off that or people go down a sympathy rather than empathy route, and that's what we want to try and avoid. We need to have a good balance. Like having a serious experience will teach you something, but having a positive spin to that experience will embed that teaching. Um, so try and add some humor to the situation, try and add some triumph, right? The triumph of achieving your goal, our catharsis. This may not be something you do as part of the task, it may be something you do as part of the debrief afterwards, but make sure that people don't just have a thoroughly bad time because that will kind of, that, will, that won't create that empathy that we're after. Uh, and the last one, which isn't particularly related to gaming, but uh, it's something that's worth mentioning anyway, is that, um, you need to consider safety. So, um, you know, you're going to be putting people in perhaps physical you know, issues where perhaps you don't want them walking into walls, for example, um, but also consider the emotional safety of your participants. So, you know, if someone has social anxiety, don't make them go and do the bio sandwich task, for example. Uh, and also consider that you're going to, there may be other people who are interacting with your players um, who perhaps haven't actually consented. Um, so just make sure that you kind of, you're considering their safety and stuff as well. So you may want to prep people. So if it's a workplace cafeteria, for example, you may want to tell them we're about to, we're about to unleash a load of people at you, um, you know, that kind of thing. And have a safe space and have a really good debrief. The Nordic Freeform stuff I talked about earlier, like it's very, very dark stuff that people are playing with, but the reason it works um, and the reason it doesn't traumatize people is because they make sure they have this safe space to debrief and they have aftercare. So allow people to share their feelings and experiences. People are gonna have profound experiences. And I think we as accessibility professionals might think of those as being very basic and being like, well, people going like, oh, it's very hard to use a computer with a screen reader or whatever. Or it's very hard to use a computer when you, your vision is impaired and you go, well, yeah, of course it is, that's why we're here. Um, but you know, but 
we should allow people to have those very profound experiences even if we think of them as being a bit basic and there's no such thing as a bad question. So the last 10 minutes, I just kind of want to go through a few bits and pieces. So just a few games that I recommend that I've kind of played as I've, as I've gone through. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about digital games a bit is because actually empathy requires time and it requires repetition. So they found that actually if you get people to play a game more than once, that that actually improves, that, that makes the empathy kind of stick a bit more and it kind of, the empathy will kind of grow over time. So consider, even if you use a different form of game in your simulation exercise, consider having digital games available so that people use those as refreshes. And it also kind of helps people engage with this process after they've done their training. Um, so I'm just going to recommend about three games that I, I found really, really interesting as I was looking at this. So the first game is called Stage Fright. It's a PC game. Um, so Stage Fright is about a pianist and the pianist, uh, the game basically works where you, it's a bit like Guitar Hero where notes kind of come down from the top of the screen and when they get to the bottom of the screen, you press the corresponding key and it makes the right noise. Um, the thing with this game is this pianist has anxiety. Um, and so when you're playing the piano in the game, uh, when you get stuff wrong, or sometimes even when you haven't got anything wrong, things will get weird. So the sound will become distorted and you can't hear the notes properly. The, the actual interface will, will jump around, it will disappear. You know, there's distortion over the top of the screen. That's what this kind of screenshot is showing. Um, and for me, as, as someone who suffers with anxiety as well, like it's a really good simulation of what it is like to try and claw back. Once you've hit panic, it's a really good simulation of how difficult it is to get back on track. Um, so this is really, really good. Um, it does have jump scares though, I warn you for that though, because the anxiety is personified by a character and that, so there's a couple of like little horror tropes and stuff in here as well. So just might, if you're sensitive to that, then, then mind that. The second game uh, is called Robin, which again is a PC game. So Robin is about chronic fatigue. And the idea to, in Robin is that you're in this room and you've got a lot of things that, there are a lot of tasks that you need to do. It's part of life. You need to wash up, you need to eat, you need to feed your birds, you need to socialize, you need to water your plants, tidy your room, make your bed, all those kind of things. Uh, and throughout the game, you kind of have goals that you have to do each day. Um, but you can only do a limited number of things um, because you know if you're familiar with spoon theory, you know that the idea that there's only so many, there's kind of a, almost a set number of things you can do in a day. So. It's like, OK, I need to make something to eat. But if I make something to eat, that means I'm not going to have any energy left to tidy my room. But then if I leave my room to get messier, then that's going to reduce the amount of energy I have because my room's a mess. But then if I tidy my room, then, you know, but that means I actually I can't do any work today, those kind of things. So it kind of simulates that decision making exercise of just trying to live your life uh, with something like chronic fatigue. Uh, and the last one is a game called Microservice. This isn't a PC game, it's not a digital game, it's a what we call a pen and paper game. It's a tabletop RPG. So all you literally need for this is the game. Um, like I said, there's links to this in, uh, I've got a website at the end and there's links to this on the slide as well. Um, you literally you need four spoons and you need two dice. Um, and so this game is, uh, so it's called Microservice. It's a game that was written by someone who uses a service dog. So it's kind of a, a satirical view of her, um, their experience of, of owning a service dog and having to do stuff in the world. Um, so the idea is you need to go into a store and buy three things. Uh, and every time you try to do something, you have an obstacle. So the obstacle is something like, you know, the shopkeeper telling you you can't have your dog in here. It's children touching your dog, those kind of things. And then you kind of roll dice to see if you can get through that encounter. Um, and then if you don't get through the encounter properly, if you fail, then you lose a spoon. So the idea is that actually, you know, can you actually do this thing of buying three things in the shop and leaving the shop? you know, with the energy that you've got. So, and, and, and I think a few people have, as I've kind of done this talk, said like, I, I have seen that other couple of people played this, members of my team at work have played this. Um, like I said, it's really short. You can do it by yourself, you can do it in pairs. Um, and it's just kind of a really little good fun um, way of kind of showing that kind of difficulty and it's quite a good little satire. So in the last uh, five minutes or so, I just want to talk, I just want to go back over what we talked about. So. We talked about simulation exercises, but they simulate a disability, um, but actually they can cause distress, they can cause very negative emotions. And because of that, they don't actually improve impact. Uh, and in some cases they can in fact be harmful. Um, you know, they can make it worse, that your people may less likely to engage with disabled people. Um, they don't create the right type of empathy. Play, particularly games, but all kinds of play uh, are good for generating empathy. Um, you know, there are, like I said, there's many studies, there's, there's been a lot of work in kind of looking at how that works um, and kind of kind of ways to go about that. And lots of people use games in order to make people empathize with certain situations that they might find dif difficult to empathize otherwise. And then we also looked at 
these six things that we can add to our simulation exercises to try and increase their impact um, based on what we know from gaming, all that sort of empathy. So we talked about role taking, but you know, taking a role of playing a character uh, can help decrease that distress as opposed to being yourself experiencing disability, which is what creates that distress. We talked about goals and how goals and decision making um, allow us to create that kind of empathetic identity and it makes people feel good to achieve things. Uh, we talked about challenge, which is how hard you want to make it to achieve those goals um, and how making it impossible isn't the best thing to do, um, even though it is the better reflection of the real world. That actually when we get people to do a task, we should make sure it's hard, but not impossible. So we don't have that distress. We talked a little bit about social uh, connection, about how you, know, you should use the fact that you have other people, collaborate, compete, um, you know, those kind of things uh, can be helpful. It's also about balance, making sure that we balance the negative experiences and the experiences of barriers with positive experience, not only to embed those experiences, um, but also to better reflect what it's like to be a disabled person. You know, we disabled people aren't just a walking thing of barriers, right? You know, like your life is about other things. Um, and then also about safety, because ultimately as facilitators, as trainers, we have responsibility to make sure that it is safe for people um, in our training and we're not making them do anything that would be kind of emotionally or physically dangerous. So yeah, so um, that's kind of everything I wanted to talk about. Um, all the references can be found on this link. Uh, so this is sim-play-id24.netlify.app. Um, so I assume the slides of, of this will be sent out at some point and it's in the slides. Um, you can email me or tweet me if you've got kind of any questions and stuff as well. And we're going to book you in at the end. Um, I'm really interested actually in hearing how this works out. So like I said before, my original intention was to kind of start implementing some of these and seeing where I got to, um, but that hasn't particularly happened. Um, I do know that some people are doing this stuff already. So someone spoke to me about how they, the, the thing with the screen reader, you know, like people have got to get through and they have like heats and stuff and like a semi-final and a final and they've got to kind of get through the, the page as quickly as possible. And they said they were finding that people were practicing or that people were getting into dev tools and like changing the code to make it easier. Like people were cheating at the game, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, you know, and I do know some people have played microservice as well, kind of based off uh, me kind of recommending it to people. So I really want to know kind of how this goes um, and if people don't use any of this stuff or even if like, you know, I get to use any of this stuff once we're kind of allowed back out into society, you know, and I'd really love to be back next year, you know, and saying like, hey, I have solved everything uh, by making this game about something. I know that's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, but I'd be really interested to kind of hear from people kind of how this goes. Um, yeah, like I said, you can find all the references. I put the key references at the top because there were loads of things I read as research for this and some of them made it into this and some of them didn't. Um, so all the key references are at the top and then the mountain of other references. And right at the bottom, I've got a, loads more games than the ones I've recommended and links to them so you can go and buy them or try them out and something like that to kind of find out um, what kind of stuff is out there, um, which would be pretty cool. And uh, thanks so much for listening and thanks very much to uh, ID24 for having me. Excellent, and thank you for uh, presenting uh, another. There's too much. There's too much information um, in all of these talks today. My head is exploding, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a, a lot of really interesting stuff to uh, chew over. Thank you, Chad. Um, okay. Alistair, do we have questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, Kelsey asked, um, how can we help people more seamlessly consider the experiences of many people with different disabilities, uh, not just the first, the, the few that they learned about through a simulation? And I think she's thinking about that in the context of products and services. Uh, particularly around kind of um, simulating them, or I think part well, of it is that Sorry. So yeah, just getting um, getting people to understand the variety, because if you do like one or two exercises mm. in a training kind of session, people might mm. focus on that a lot. Yeah, um, there is this problem that, that a lot of or some kind of conditions are easier to simulate than others. Um, and particularly in the video games I was looking at, like there's lots of video games around things like mental health and things like anxiety and things like chronic fatigue, but there's less around kind of things like mobility issues, for example, just the way the medium is. I think the thing to do is to kind of have a variety of different simulations and tasks for people to do. You know, don't get everyone to do the same thing, you know, kind of set people off on kind of their own 
tasks with various different types of simulation and then when you get people back in at the end for that debrief you get people then to kind of share their experiences you know so you have some people who are going to do the visual impairment stuff some people doing mobility stuff some people kind of you know uh, perhaps simulating you know having uh, being hard of hearing stuff for example um and then use that. the debrief really is the point right that the simulation exercise is basically we're going to do that just so we have stuff for people to talk about in the debrief people to kind of hang off and kind of show those experiences so you know if you kind of have many small exercises and people either do multiple of them or you have many people and they each do one of them but at the end of they all come together and talk about those things um again i said like you know with the role taking if you can base that off people's real experiences you know and people very rarely have one disability kind of as we know so you know if you can go okay perhaps bob who i'm talking about yeah is visually impaired but you know perhaps also has like arthritis in his foot for example um you know so kind of creating that role and basing it off kind of real experiences lived experience is really important to kind of set up that that idea you know that actually disabled people are 3d full people uh, rather than just you know popping a pair of glasses on yeah and no, the the bit about um uh, setting a role kind of really resonated with me because I've, I've seen that happen where you put people in a position whether it's using the screen reader or the glasses or or something else where they have that kind of shock of, uh, as you said, like losing sight mm -hmm. rather than, you know, it being a lived thing that they're used to, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yeah, having to get people past that, that very much resonated. Um, I had another sort of little question around, I mean, most of the simulations, particularly in face-to-face -face training, tend to be physically based. It was really interesting with the the computer games uh, being a good source of you know um, experience psychosis or uh, not really but you know the, the, there, was, there was some experience there. Do you know of any other um, sort of more cognitive based simulations that are more suitable for a kind of training scenario? Um, I do have stuff. There is stuff in the link. Um, it is my mind has gone completely blank about what actual games I talked about um in there but there's there's quite a few in there um there's kind of there are some kind of um competitive not competitive like collaborative games you can get where two people will play um play different roles but that's particularly around kind of like um there's a couple of games where like one character is blind and one character is is deaf for example and um, you have to kind of collaborate um there are, but I genuinely have completely had a, <laughs> my, my brain's <laughs> completely fallen right. out and I can't remember any of them, but. Um, it's but, good I to mean, know, I, I will I'll yeah. check them out afterwards. Um, and I'm sure there, there is a, some stuff. <laughs> I'm sure oh. there's a film about that one person being blind, one person being deaf. It's yeah. really old, there's, probably um, slightly dodgy 80s film. Yeah, I mean, there is another tabletop game, which is around and um, that you play it by yourself. It's kind of a mix between a game and a, creating a journal, essentially, where you kind of uh, play uh, through kind of cognitive issues so often you use something that, that perhaps people want to play their own cognitive issues but you play through something like addiction and stuff and you kind of so you're kind of half creating a dungeon as you play and then you're kind of half also kind of journal it, like journaling your experiences and I've, I've definitely have a link to that um and so that one's kind of quite good for like how do you overcome um or how do you kind of how do you manage kind of some certain conditions like depression or addiction so you know that I can't remember the name of it now but it is in the link hmm. and I'm wondering if you um uh, particularly in a training scenario would uh, sort of keep the, the simulation aspect separate from, um, I mean, there's lots of practical things you'd want to train people about in accessibility that, you know, how to do things in their day-to-day -day role. Do you mm. tend to do like the simulation first and then cover practical things later? Yes, I think the way that, that I've kind of seen it done and the way I've done it is that, you know, you kind of start off with that very basic awareness of, of what disability is, because a lot of people don't know, or a lot of people have got very, um, a lot of people do kind of come in with their own lived experience, either through like relatives or what have you, but, you know, uh, people very rarely have experience um, or understanding of all the different types of disability, um, particularly that they're hidden on. So yeah, I would start with perhaps the simulation exercises and then work on to practicalities. I mean, you can work it together. You can say, actually, you know, that you, um, you know, one of your tasks could be, like I said, you know, to, to test your own website, how fast can you get through it with a screen reader, for example. Um, you know, so you kind of, you can kind of create that part of it as well, you know, and, and you could, like I said, you know, because these things do take time and repetition, you know, maybe that actually just training people once isn't really enough, but you may want to get people back and go, okay, like, let's try it again and let's see, you know, what you've learned and what, how, you, how have you improved your service and let's try it again, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, it's, 
it's good for raising awareness and that's one of the reasons I think you because know, a lot of people just say you know to get rid of the simulation exercises altogether and I kind of have a lot of sympathy for that uh, standpoint but actually you know people do really people really do engage with them they're a really good point of interaction especially we're doing like a lot of training in physical space where it can get quite dull if you just lecture people you know it's a good point of interaction you know, people do talk a lot about it it generates lots of conversations um so I wouldn't advocate dropping them really but you know but you do need to add the practical skills on it so yeah think about the task when you're generating your task and you think about what you actually want people to achieve and it may depend on whether you're talking to designers or developers or you know product people or what have you uh but yeah adjusting your exercise accordingly yeah and i found um again the, the challenge bit you were talking about resonated because uh, i often set people as part of using their own website um with mm. in, in various ways and um you always have to have a backup because you know their website is really good and they they don't have a challenge um or mm. it can quite often be really terrible and they just get to it and so have a backup would be my tip on that <laughs> yeah you don't want people to kind of just like open your own website and they press tab once and it doesn't work and you go well that's that's this over isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah indeed definitely have a backup um and uh, yeah, I guess my last question was uh, probably should have been my first, but I'm, I am curious how you, which came first, the kind of accessibility or the game studies and how did they interact for or intersect for you? Both of them are I've interested in for a while. Um, actually, so I did my master's at the University of York um, and they're very heavy on accessibility and on game studies, actually. Um, so the course I was on was kind of a, a bit of both anyway. So uh, there was that intersection and um, I'm very interested in the accessibility of gaming because I think that's, that's some really interesting stuff. And I went to the game accessibility conference last year and that was really, really nice. Um, I think for me, it was actually like, these are just two things I know a lot about and I wanted to see if I could just smash them together. Um, because, you know, I, I do, I am a bit of a hippie in that sense. I do believe like gaming can do really good things. Um, and I've kind of seen that through my own studies. I was looking at uh, Discomfort and one of the games I was talking about was a game that, which is basically a, a simulation of, um, is a game about being like a border guard type thing. You know, and a lot, of this, a lot of my findings from that were actually like people really had a lot of empathy and had a lot of understanding of what that's like. Um, and so, yeah, just, just when I first heard that kind of like, oh, go and play with these, it sort of ticks my brain and went, oh, if it's play, can we do something cool with that? Um, will that help? Um, you know, and I, I just kind of think like, because that's kind of my intersection of, of interest, I thought maybe that's a bit of an interesting, bit of a unique idea. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm very interested in things like, it's so a serious game, so something I'm interested in because that's kind of a way that, you know, people talk about using serious games to teach children things um, as opposed to like lecturing them or whatever or medical students using VR simulators I've got a VR headset you know and I started looking at um, there's a game well, it's not really a game experience called notes for blindness or notes on blindness um, and that's like a really interesting experience and VR brings loads of really cool things but I don't really think I could get away with advocating that you buy all of your trainees like an Oculus Quest uh, I don't think any of us have got that resource um, but there's lots of really interesting things going on in that space kind of around simulating things and kind of improving immersion and empathy and I think like that that's something kind of reset me off and go, okay, like what's out there? Um, and is it good and does it help? Cool. Thank you very much. I've made a note of that one. I'll, I'll check it out. And yeah, it sounds like there's lots of uh, resources to look through uh, in that link. Um, so I do recommend people check it out. Uh, and then, Thief, over to you, I think. Yeah. Thanks again, Chad. Very interesting. Um, if you like this session, hit that YouTube like button. And don't forget, you can subscribe to youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24 to be kept in the loop on our future events. And a, the, the ever, ever uh, including des, uh, reminder is that Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with thanks to Parkway Access, Adobe, and Intopia, uh, Tetralogical, Infoaxia, Intuit, WebAble, DQ Systems, and the one and only Adrian Rosselli LLC. Inclusive Design will be back on the hour with our next session. See you then.